Ladies and gentlemen, what does it take to make a difference in the world? This is a question that I've been asking myself over the past 20 years, as I've worked in different ways with teams of activists, change agents, and social entrepreneurs from business, government, and civil society, working on addressing challenges in health, food, education, justice, development, sustainability, and peace in the Americas, Europe, the Middle East, Africa, Asia, and Australasia. The main benefit of working on one question for 20 years is that you have many opportunities for trial and many opportunities for error, and so many opportunities for learning. Here is the most important thing I have learned. There are two distinct, dominant ways of trying to make a difference in the world. Two camps, if you will. The first camp believes that what it takes to make a difference in the world is to focus on developing yourself, on achieving your goals, on doing your work. The second camp believes that what it takes to make a difference in the world is to focus on connecting with one another and with the earth, on healing and on making things whole. It turns out that these two camps are radically polarized. The first camp thinks that the second camp is romantic and impractical, even unrealistic. And the second camp thinks that the first camp is selfish and aggressive, even irresponsible. When I look back at the past 20 years, I realize that I've seen this precise polarization and tension at every scale of human system. I've seen this tension at the global level. In uh, December of last year, I was at the United Nations Conference on Climate Change in Copenhagen, and on the one side I saw a focus on economic growth and development and sovereignty from both rich and poor countries, and on the other side a focus on the health of humanity and the planet as a whole. I've seen this tension at the national level. I saw it in South Africa in 1991 during the transition away from apartheid. Uh, on the on the one side, a focus of each population group on getting what it wanted, and on the other side, a focus on uniting, on ending the apartness of apartheid. I've seen it at the local level. I saw it in Houston, working on the development of the city. On one side, an emphasis on entrepreneurialism and letting uh, human capacity blossom and on the other side, a focus on community. I've seen it in every organization I've worked for or with, whether it's been educational institutions or government institutions or businesses or NGOs. On the one side, a focus of each person and each part of getting on with doing their job, and on the other side, a focus on working as a team with a common purpose. I've seen this tension in families, in my own family, on the one side, an emphasis on independence, on doing your thing, on getting on with your life, and on the other side, an emphasis on togetherness and family solidarity. And finally, I've seen exactly the same tension within myself, a drive to do my thing, to achieve my destiny, and on the other side, a drive for connection and communion. So there's something going on here, some phenomenon in the world that's a, a fractal phenomenon, something that has the same properties at every scale. And what I've been trying to understand is what's this about? What's, what's going on here that we can see at every level from the global to the individual? What I've come to understand is that we're dealing, what we're dealing with here are two basic universal human drives. And I call these two drives power and love. Now this immediately causes problems in trying to explain what I mean because everybody has their own understanding of what power and love mean. 
I'm using two very specific definitions that uh, were offered by a German-American existential theologian whose name was Paul Tillich. And I'm using these definitions not because I have any particular allegiance to German-American existential theology. I <laughs> uh, don't know that much about it, to be honest. But I find that Tillich's definitions have enormous explanatory value. Much of what I've seen over the past 20 years in my work and around me, I can understand through the way Tillich talks about power and love. Tillich defines power as the drive of everything living to realize itself with increasing intensity and extensity. The drive of everything living to realize itself with increasing intensity and extensity. The clearest image I have of what Tillich means by power, do you know this uh, NGO movement called Guerrilla Gardening? So Guerrilla Gardeners are these people in a built-up city like Seattle who skulk around in the middle of the night and find a, a vacant lot that's covered with with, uh, with rubbish or, or rubble, and they put seeds on the ground knowing that the seeds will, will grow through the rubbish and rubble and will create a green spot. So this is what, this is power in, as the drive of everything living to realize itself with increasing intensity and extensity, like the drive of a seed. Tillich goes on to, this, to define love as the drive towards the unity of the separated. The drive towards the unity of the separated. And what's implied by this definition is there is some underlying wholeness which is or which appears to be fractured. And love is the drive to reunite that which has been separated. So you're probably thinking this sounds pretty straightforward. Self-realization, reunification. What's the problem here? Working with power and love, in theory, conceptually, is very simple and very straightforward. But it turns out that in practice, it's difficult and even dangerous. And the reason it's difficult and dangerous to work with power and love is because, as everybody knows, power has two sides. It has a generative, life-giving side, and it also has a degenerative, oppressive side. The other reason it's difficult to work with power and love is because, as not everybody knows, love also has two sides. It has a generative life-giving side, and it also has a degenerative disabling side. In my class at last year, there were uh, quite a few students from Texas, and the uh, wonderful thing about studying with Texans is they have this great way of talking. And uh, one of my classmates uh, was telling me a story about his son having gone to the Netherlands and fallen in love. And he said, when my son came home from the Netherlands, he was so in love, he wasn't worth shooting. <laughs> now these two sides of power and two sides of love show up in human systems at all scales, from the global to the individual. I could give you lots of examples, but the, the simplest example I can think of, if you want to see the two sides of power and two sides of love, is just to think about the historically constructed role of the man and the woman in a marriage. The man representing masculine power, the woman re representing feminine love. You can see the generative side of the man's power. He goes up to work in the morning with his little briefcase, the generative side of his power is that he can, can make something new in the world. The degenerative side of his power, which is the subject of a hundred novels and a hundred films, is he can become so focused on his work, his destiny, that he becomes cut off from his colleagues, from his family, from his community, and he becomes a robot or a tyrant. So these are the two sides of power. If you want to see the two sides of love, just look at the historically constructed role of the woman, representing feminine love. The generative side of her love is that she literally gives birth to the children, figuratively to the family, but can become so focused on holding the family together, on creating unity, that she undermines the power of the members of the family and much more fundamentally undermines her own power. So these are the two sides of love. 